to her perfect rhythm. Oh, it's good to see your faces this morning. Thank you for uh, coming out and uh, being with us for worship. Thank you to those folks who are streaming in from wherever you may be. We are aware that you are with us, and that means so much. Uh, so many things going on. We are officially in the season of Lent. We had our Ash Wednesday service. Wednesday, ironically, uh, <laughs> and we are in that period of uh, personal reflection, journeying with Christ to the cross. Uh, in, in thinking about these things, we have a number of ways that you can make uh, more meaningful your journey. In addition to our Sunday worship, uh, there are Lenten devotional guides you got uh, a link if you are a subscriber to The Buzz, which is our newsletter. Um, if you aren't a subscriber yet, there are orange cards in the pews in front of you, and you can put your name and email address, and we'll get The Buzz to you weekly on Fridays. Um, so The Buzz has a link to the devotional guide. <clears throat> in addition, Wednesday nights, starting this Wednesday, we'll have our Lenten soup, supper, and devotional gathering from 6 to 8 p.m. There are sign-ups on the big long table out there where you can sign up to bring something and or just to bring yourself, which is just fine as well. I hope you'll consider joining us. Also out on the table, you'll find a Lenten calendar. We emailed one and the link still goes to the old one, but there were some uh, updates and some, some edits and the current one is on the long table. It's out there for you to pick up. And the calendar takes you through some exercises you can do through the season of Lent, but also uh, offers some suggestions for things you can donate for our food pantry. So please consider visiting the Lenten table. Um, after church today, we have Zoom fellowship for the folks who are streamers. If you are streaming from somewhere uh, in cyberspace, whether you're in state or beyond, and you'd like to just kind of touch base, base with some of our our folks here. Our mission commission will be on the other end of that stream today uh, to welcome you and just to chat, you know, bring your cup of coffee and hang out. Uh, the way you'll find us on that Zoom chat is again through the buzz. The link will be in the buzz. So take a look. You can find the buzz, if not in your email, at the bottom of the home page. Um, there will be a link there. In addition, after church, any of the adults who are considering uh, a little summer mission trip, not summer, sorry, early spring mission trip, April 7th through the 13th. This is an adult trip, not a youth trip, although those young adults who are out of high school are eligible to come and join us. Uh, again, an adult opportunity to make homes warmer, safer, and drier in central Appalachia. We'll be going to Jonesville, Virginia, which is uh, a beautiful location with a beautiful porch. So when you're recovering from a day's work, you can rock in the rocking chair and look at the mountains and reflect on God's glory. They're, they're such wonderful trips. So even if you're not sure it's for you, you can meet with me after church downstairs in the cave. We'll talk you through what to expect and you can kind of determine, uh, you know, no skills required. Um, they took me with no skill whatsoever. And now I've refinished my kitchen cabinets, so go me. You too can refinish your own kitchen cabinets if you go on ASP and learn your way around all of the uh, saws and, and drills and things that uh, can do amazing work. So please consider that. Tonight we have an organ recital by our own maestro, Benjamin Berman, uh, and I hope you'll come out and support Ben, but you're also, woohoo! I think you're blushing. <laughs> I love it. Um, I'm excited about it. At 5 p.m., there's an admission cost, $20, which really will be going to feed directly our concert fund. We are dreaming about a concert series annually. 
um, and we've already um, contracted with Carrie Newcomer to come back in October as part of the concert series. So we're serious about music here, and I hope you're serious about it too, and will come out and join us tonight at five. The men's retreat is coming up. It is next Saturday. Um, you have to be a man to go. All right. Um, but they've gotten great uh, participation and response thus far, and it is still open. Anyone available from 9 to 2.30 who would like to join them is welcome to do that. They'll be led by Lou Ruprecht and Brooke Smith and Bill Devilback, and now I understand Ben is going to be there as well. So it will be really a special time. All you need to do is just bring a bag lunch. They're going to share lunch together. Again, start at 9 o'clock, finish by 2.30. Uh, a reminder that next week we have a church chat, and church chat means you grab a cup of coffee, you come back, and this is one that's focused primarily on the Martinsville campus. I told you at the annual meeting that Session's been working very hard to discern God's call to us about the beautiful gift of that campus, and that we have made some decisions which uh, we want to tell you about. So we're hoping you'll stay after church. I want a cliffhanger teaser, right? We hope that you'll come and stick around and hear about what we are exploring. We've not committed fully to anything, but we have determined a direction of exploration. And now we want to share that with you and to get your feedback. So I'm excited about that. That's next week after church. And finally, Drum roll, who can give me a drum roll? Your generosity last week at the Super Bowl event uh, sponsored by our youth ministry in support of all the mission activities that they're planning to engage in with our, our youth ministry. You raised over $2,000 in, in soup. Woo! And it was a fantastic time, and we just want to say thank you, that we're so grateful for all the many ways that you support the work of God through this congregation. And what? Oh, uh, so I, I got word that I need to let you know that we have um, everyone who participated was a winner, right? But the one whose soup raised the most funds Lori Richard, right there in the back. All right, folks. God is in the house. So let's let the dust settle on all the things that are floating around in your noggin. And let's uh, prepare ourselves, open our hearts and our minds that we might hear the Spirit speaking. Let us prepare ourselves for this morning's worship. <clears throat>
Come in. Feel your feet on the floor. Settle your worries. Take a deep breath. Dust the cobwebs from your ears. Relax the tension in your jaw. Christ is here. God never stops teaching us. We have been found. Let us find God in return. Let us worship the God of deep waters. Amen. Blessed be the God of our salvation. Who bears our burdens and our sins. Let us confess our sins together. Loving God, you call us by name. You join us in the deep waters of life. You invite us to drop our nets and follow you. And yet more often than you'd like to admit, we are like Peter. Over and over again, we stand slack-jawed and surprised to find you in our midst. Forgive us for drowning out your voice with our own. Forgive us for assuming that we can tackle deep waters by ourselves. Forgive us for forgetting that you will never stop climbing into our boat. Turn our hearts, our minds, and our spirits toward you. For you are the Lord our God, and it is in your name that we pray. Amen. Church family, hear and believe this good news. You can make a thousand bad impressions. You can make every mistake in the book, roll your eyes and assume you know better. And even still, Christ will forgive you, claim you and continue to seek your heart. That is the good news of the gospel. Rest, celebrate and trust in that. 
Amen. Bound in the snow. Have a seat right there, kiddos. All right. All right. Can anybody tell me what these are? What are these things? What is this? Okay. And what do you think is in here? What do you think is in here? A candle. Wine? No, not wine. <laughs> this is candle. All right. This is a candle. There's a little sand in there, too. And what are candles used for? To make light. What else are they used for? They're also used for warming up. These are excellent answers, wonderful answers. What else? You light it up with fire, and fire is hot, and that's what warms us up. Do you know why we have these candles here in church? That's right, because we show the light of God. You guys are really smart, really smart. So that's exactly right. This is the light that we light because we want to show God's light and how God's light is always present. Even when you don't see that candle burning, the light of God is burning inside of you. Even when we make mistakes, even when we argue with our siblings, even when we don't get a good grade on our test, God is always shining inside of us. So we want to thank God for this light that takes away the darkness and keeps us warm and toasty inside with love. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your amazing light. We ask God that you burn inside of us and that the light we have inside we can share with other people and be excited about who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. morning. Please pray with me. Holy God, reveal your presence to us this day as we journey this path with your Son. Through all of life's trials and tribulations, your word sustains us for the journey ahead. Send your Spirit upon us that we might listen, discern, and take heart. Be near us this day and may your word stay with us and dwell within us forevermore. Amen.
my soul. O oh my God, in you I trust. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. Gospel as attributed to Luke. Once, while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gensaray, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long, but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Simon Peter will be our guide through the season of Lent. We'll be following the Lenten devotional guide, again, made available to you uh, through an email uh, link and the buzz and hard copies outside. Um, and the guide is called Wandering Heart, Figuring Out Faith with Peter. It's by a sanctified art. These are the same folks who brought to us our Advent devotional, How Does a Weary World Rejoice? So you can expect to find commentary on the scriptures and poetry and art and questions for journaling and reflection. All of the gospel readings will be about Peter. Peter's awesome. He's a little bit of everyone. 
And so we will learn from his journey with Jesus maybe a little something about our own. We already started our journey with Peter last week because it was the lectionary that brought us to the story of the transfiguration. And you remember, Jesus goes up the mountain and there he takes Peter, James, and John. It's a retreat, it's preparatory, it's also a hinge moment where his ministry moves from the Galilee region of healing and teaching now his eyes are set on Jerusalem and he knows what awaits him there, even if Peter, James, and John don't quite get it. And you remember it was Peter who, when Jesus transfigured and his clothing turned whiter than any bleach could make them, and when all of a sudden two other men appeared and they were Moses and Elijah, that Peter says, it's good that we're here. Understatement. And then... He says, let's pitch some tents and stay a while, which, would, of course, was not the plan. And that's what we love about Peter. He just says what he's thinking. He is, yay, this is awesome, so glad I'm here. Hey, let's make it a party. No. So today we're going to go back to the beginning, to his invitation to discipleship. That's really in part or in whole what Lent is about. It's about our journey as disciples of Jesus Christ. And we read just a few weeks back as part of Epiphany, the story in Mark's gospel of the call of Peter. Remember? They're at the shore of the Sea of Galilee and Jesus comes by and says, follow me. They drop their nets and they go. And I said, wait, there's got to be more to the story. Mark is a little short on details which gives us plenty of room to use our imagination. But Luke adds some details that we didn't get from the Gospel of Mark. And it's those details that are so very important to our Lenten journey with Peter. Simon Peter and company have been fishing all day, which is their profession. It is their business, and they are exhausted and disappointed and discouraged because all day, no fish. No fish. Now, it's something that can but rarely happens to fishermen, and it is not pleasant when it happens. Because when you catch no fish, and it is your business to catch fish, then you make no money. No income. So not a great day. And then they are pulling their boats in, ready to go home, and they're going to have to tell their families, no money today. And Jesus hops in Simon Peter's boat. It's been such a long day already. But Jesus has been teaching the crowd, and the crowd has been gathering and pressing in, and it's hard for one man to speak as the crowds crowd him, and so he decides it's best that he hop in a boat and have the fishermen, in this case Simon Peter, pull the boat out just far enough that he can teach from a little bit of a distance. So he can see the people to whom he is teaching and talking, and So uh, Peter dutifully is like, okay. And he rows the boat out a little from the shore and Jesus does his thing. And we don't know if he teaches for minutes or hours. But when he's done, it must have come as a relief to Peter who was ready to go home and call it a day. Sit back on his couch, maybe crack open a beer and watch a game. No, Maybe not any of that. I don't know. But instead, Jesus says, let's go out to the deep water and throw your net out. Now, Jesus is a lot of things. A wandering rabbi, a miracle worker, perhaps a carpenter. At least his dad, we think, was a carpenter. But he's not a fisherman. And so Peter pushed back a little bit because now Jesus is in his lane. 
I've been out all day. Let me just tell you, there's nothing out there. But then he says a remarkable thing, and hold on to this. But if you say so, I'll go. And he rose out. Jesus says, do it. And you know the rest of the story. What a great story to begin our Lenten journey. Lent is the season of introspection. We are journeying with Jesus to the cross and the grave and beyond. And it begs one to look inward with vigorous honesty. That's the phrase we used on Ash Wednesday, that this is a season of vigorous honesty with ourselves. Because every story will beg the question, what would we have done? No, really, what would we have done? And how far would we have been willing to travel with Jesus once things turned a little ugly and dangerous? And we said on Wednesday that the outward journey of faith, the living out of the gospel in our lives, which is kind of the point, isn't it? To live this story, this good news, these teachings out in our lives that the kingdom of God might come ever nearer. It must be fueled, if that's going to happen in your life and mine, by an internal transformation of the heart. So in Lent, we kind of look at our hearts and what's going on in there. What is the condition of our heart and our faith? I would say to you that faith is the fuel that moves us forward in lockstep with Jesus. Faith, in order to do its work, requires trust. And trust is not always easy because trusting in Jesus means surrendering. Not a word that makes the heart leap, but surrendering to the one who knows best. And guess what that one who knows best is? It's not you and it's not me. It's a hard thing to get your head around that we may not always know what is best. How many of you have ever found it annoying when someone tries to backseat drive your life? Ooh. Whether that be your professional life, a colleague tries to tell you how to do your job, or it's relational advice you didn't ask for, but somebody wants to tell you what's wrong with your relationship and how you can fix it. Or maybe somebody wants to backseat drive your parenting. Grandparents, we kind of like to do that. Because <laughs> we know best. Maybe, maybe we might be open to the advice of somebody from the outside, an expert in the field in which we work. We might take the advice of an expert or a self-help guru. We might buy one of those books at Barnes & Noble that's going to promise us a healthy relationship in 10 days or, or whatever it is. But when it's somebody close to you, an acquaintance or a friend or a family member, we don't want to take that advice. This is my life. And we might balk, and by we I mean me, <laughs> at the advice somebody too close to me tries to give. Because there's a couple things that get in the way of trust. And that is not to say, by the way, that everybody that wants to backseat your life is right because that takes discernment. But when Jesus is your co-pilot, you can pretty much trust that Jesus knows best. But what gets in the way? Pride gets in the way. And if we're to be honest with ourselves this Lenten season, we might find a little bit of pride 
<clears throat> kind of hanging out in our hearts, kind of getting in the way of doing the things that, me, that most need to be done. Maybe you'll hear this Lenten season that there is a relationship in your life that needs mending, and you maybe will have to own part of the responsibility for the brokenness thereof, right? And maybe you will find that what Jesus is calling you to do is to ask for forgiveness. But you don't want to pick up that phone or make that, that drive or sit down with that person and do that work because there's something prideful in you that doesn't want to admit that part of the problem is you. Pride gets in the way. But so even more does fear. If I trust you, what will happen? I think it's very human to want to be in control of our circumstances. We're all old enough in this room to know that just because you think you have control doesn't mean you do. Life happens. But to the degree that we think we can manage it, control it, we kind of like to hold the reins. I imagine, I don't know if fear plays a role in, the, in this particular Peter story, unless it's fear of being embarrassed among his colleagues in the fishing profession as they watch him row further and further out into the deep water, throwing his net in a place they all know there's no fish. In my imagination, I'm doing a little mid-rashing of the story, and we get to do that. But it's not hard to understand that if pride doesn't get in the way of following Jesus, then fear certainly can. I want to tell you a little story about a woman named Antoinette Tuff, T-U-F-F, -F, but it might as well be T-O-U-G-H. Do you remember that name? Antoinette Tuff. She was the office worker in the Learning Academy in Decatur, Georgia in August of 2013. She's the woman who talked the 20-year-old AK-47 toting young man out of shooting up the school. Do you remember that? It is an amazing story. So she goes to work at a time in her life where things are pretty broken. Her marriage of 33 years is ending because her husband fell in love with another woman. She'd known him since she was 13. And she had just picked up the phone and gotten a call that her car was in danger of being repossessed unless she came up with $15,000 working in an office in a preschool. And she would cry out to God, I don't know what you're doing, but help. And in the midst of that chaos, which was fresh that day, a young man dressed all in black came bursting in to the office, and she barely even gave him a second thought. She thought this is just a joke, but the first thing he said is, this is not a joke. And he fired a shot in that office, and it breezed right past her face, and it ricocheted round the room. And in her heart and in her human mind, she wanted to save herself. She wanted to run. She wanted to protect herself. She wanted to do whatever she could so that she would survive. But there was another voice. And she was praying, God, what do I do? She had to listen to the 911 tapes to hear how following and trusting God in the moment, how it overtook her very being. She had called 911 and the phone line was open and you can hear in the recording her talking to the young man. Not begging for her life or the life of the children, but addressing him as a broken but beloved child of God. The only magic to her words were divine magic. And that's not something that any one of us wants to face. Fear is sometimes 
the gift that keeps us alive. Keeps us from touching the stove when we learn that the stove is hot. But in this case, God was asking for something more. And that young man put down his gun and was arrested and not one life was taken. And the only thing that she can say is that it had to be the call of the divine speaking through her. And she says in an interview, when God calls your number, make sure that your heart is open to receive that direction that God gives you. When God calls your number, make sure that your heart is open to receive what directions God gives you. It's a big story. And chances are that those intersecting moments where the call of God and the things that God asks of us and the things that we may or may not want to do aren't going to be as big as the moment in Antonia Tuff's life. I hope it's not that big. But it is possible to say yes even when everything inside you wants to say no. I was kind of laughing because the first thing I thought about was how uh, my family likes to climb Mount Katahdin at Baxter State Park, the, the northernmost part of the Appalachian Trail. Um, I, I don't hike it with them, so I'm just telling you. This isn't my story. I, when I hike, I like to look around. When my family hikes, they like to get there. <laughs> And they like to get there fast, and I can't keep up. So it's, it was not my journey, but the kids and Laura and a few others were hiking up Katahdin, and this year there's all sorts of different ways you can go up. None of them are pleasant, not a single one. But the least pleasant of all, but of course the biggest challenge is to go knife's edge. You know what a knife's edge looks like, the edge of a knife. So imagine that you are so close to the peak, you can see it, but the only way to get there, because you took that dumb trail, is to walk this little, this little ledge that's like this with a precipitous, deadly drop on either side. And sometimes the path, yeah, exactly, sometimes the path is only maybe three feet wide. Who wants to go to Katahdin this summer? Jamie's dying to climb it again. This was the first time for most of the family members, but it was not the first time for our son, Lee, who is our oldest. And at that point, I think he was either in the upper years of high school or the beginning of college age, um, full-grown and strong, a wrestler. And there's a place on knife's edge where there's just a little break in the knife. It's maybe a serrated knife edge. I don't really know. But you have to, to get to the next part of the path. You, if, you, if you don't have really long legs, you've got to jump. And if you don't jump right, game over. Lee had done this before, and he knew how to get over, and he had the capacity to do that. And Laura gave me permission to tell you that she got to that place and said, I don't really want to do that. And Lee said, I will catch you. And Laura said, I don't want to do that. And Lee said, you have no choice. And of course, she did have a choice. She could have turned around and walked the other way, although it's really hard to pass all the traffic going to the mountain if you're going the other way and you only got three feet. So maybe she really didn't have a choice. And Lee said, I will catch you. I will catch you. And he did. He caught Laura and Katie and Jamie. And they went down another way. <laughs> they made it to the peak, but they went down another way. I think sometimes a life of faith is just like that. We think that our plans are secure. We think we know where our life is going, and then these funky turns happen. Or you get a passionate interest in something you never anticipated, and you know that you are supposed to go that way, but you don't want to do it because 
you might have to give up something or change your life or move or whatever. I, I loved my years in seminary because there was always a collection of second career students who weren't 20 or 30, but were 50 or 60, who had been um, very, very um, <clears throat> uh, accomplished businessmen or women who made, you know, easily six-figure salaries, but somehow they heard the call to ministry and they had to break it, the news to wives or husbands or children, we're going to sell the big house you're comfortable in and live in a student's apartment on a campus in Princeton for three years so that I can spend my savings on an education that isn't going to come anywhere close financially to where we've been, okay? Who's in? What's true for people is also true for churches. Sometimes we think we know where we're going or who we are or what we most need. And then we have to learn something about ourselves and pivot. Whether you're an individual disciple of Christ or the church is a community of disciples of Christ, we are forever discerning the spirit. And we don't always hear what we want to hear. But Jesus always knows best. And as Jesus catches us, so we are called to catch others that we might rise beyond ourselves and see the glory of God. Amen. going to invite our clerk of session to come over and we are going to celebrate, ordain, and install our newly elected leaders who um, have answered the call of Christ. And maybe some of them uh, may have been hesitant at first, may be hesitant today, um, but are saying yes. And for that, we are so very grateful. So please join me in the litany of gifts. There are a variety of gifts, but it is the same Spirit who gives them. There are different ways to serve God, but it is the same Lord who serves. God works through each person in a unique way, but it is God's purpose that is accomplished. To each is given the gift of the Spirit to be used for the common good. Together we are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Please come forward as your name is called. To be ordained as elders today, Taylor Graham, Peter Moody, and Gail Smith. To be ordained as deacons today, Mary Ann Bruno, Sharon Doherty, Lorna Fletcher, Sherry Gilroy, and Alexandra Moody. To be installed as elders today, Ellis Dill, Wayne Fabricius, Betsy Haas-Reimer, Dan Richard, and Damaris Dempsey. Young Vettelbeck will be installed later. And to be installed as deacons today, Kathy and Doug Bolin, Corey Peloso, and Lori Richard. Uh, Trisha Flynn will be installed later. That is an impressive group of human beings, is it not? Yeah. And 
be mindful that some of these folks have finished a term and are taking another term and so they are being installed again because they are starting a new term. And for some, it's the very first time for them in the role to which they have been called. In accordance with the Constitution of the Presbyterian Church, show your commitment to this calling by answering the following questions. Do you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior, and acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you? Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal and God's word to you? Do you? And do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? Do you and will you? Will you fulfill your ministry in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? Will you? And will you be governed by the church's polity? And will you abide by its discipline? Will you? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? Will you? Will you in your own life seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? Will you? Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? Do you? And will you pray for and seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love. Will you? A question for the deacons. Will you be a faithful deacon, teaching charity, urging concern, and directing the people's help to the friendless and those in need? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? And for those um, elected to be ruling elders. Will you be a faithful ruling elder, watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? Will you share in government and discipline, serving in councils of the church, and in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? Questions for the congregation. Do we, members of the church, accept these elders and deacons chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ. Do we? And do we agree to encourage them to respect their decisions and to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of the church? Do we? So these are the same questions that ministers of the word and sacrament respond to in their ordination that I responded to in mine. And one of the things we do when someone is ordained is what we call the laying on of hands, which connects us historically all the way back to Simon Peter as the leader of the very first and early church. And so for those who are being ordained today, I'm going to invite you to turn around and face that way if you want to kneel, you can. Not, that's not for everyone, because it's not easy for everyone. But I'm going to invite those who have, are being installed and have already been ordained to their task to come and to put a hand on a shoulder. Um, and I'm going to invite those who are actively serving on session now to come forward. Normally, we would invite all the ordained folks to come forward. But that gets to be a lot, and in a time where we're concerned about health and, and whatnot. Let's just take those actively serving on session right now or active on the Board of Deacons to come and participate in the laying on of hands. So we'll have you turn this way.
let us pray. Merciful, mysterious God, God of the lake shore and God of the church, God who calls each one unique and fills us with passions for justice and love and change and wonder. Thank you for calling these folks to ordained ministry and just as others in leadership lay hands on us, we lay hands on them. Trusting that the power of this moment and the spirit present among us will empower them to hear the spirit speaking that will encourage them when their work of service seems difficult and hard and demanding and will fill them with joy when they see Christ at work in the church. Be with our congregation and continue to speak and move in and among and through us. Lead and guide us in the present and on into the future. May we always trust that you know best. In Christ's name we pray, amen. amen. By that act and your, your expressions of faithfulness to the call of your service, you are, are, you are ordained to the ministry of deacon and or ruling elder, and we are so thankful for your work. Somewhere up here is a bulletin, and I think it says, The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Does it say that? <laughs> I don't know if it's time for that or not. I really don't know what's happening. Um, but what I do know is that uh, in addition to celebrating the leaders among us, we also celebrate you and your generosity, and we invite Carol Wilson to come up and Tell us about uh, what your dollars have done in Pakistan. Good morning. I'm here today for the Mission Commission to give you some updates <clears throat> on the Presbyterian Education Board School uh, that we support in Pakistan. And also to ask you once again for your generous donation to support the girls that we uh, support with scholarships in that one school. For over 10 years, you have been providing scholarships for Christ girls at the Christian Martin Purr Christian Girls High School in Pakistan. This year, it's a wonderful um, event that four of those girls have graduated. So it occurs to me that perhaps we have supported their education through school to graduation where they can go on to college or meaningful work. Um, this is only possible by your donations because these girls come from extremely uh, low income families that could never afford to pay the tuition. The other thing that we're celebrating is that PEB is celebrating 25 years of running 25 schools in Pakistan. They're independent of the state. When the state had run the schools, um, they were not able to educate girls. And now since PEB has taken over the schools, they're, educate, they're able to educate boys and girls. The other thing they are able to do is be schools of interfaith. So Muslim and Christian students learn to tolerate, respect, and study together in Pakistan, in your school that you're supporting. Um, since this, when the state ran the schools, they did not um, do repairs on the schools. So another event that will be happening is the primary school that our students attend 
is not, um, they're not able to use that school. So there's a project in, on, underway to give our, these primary students a brand new school. So another thing to really celebrate. Um, beginning in March for five Sundays, uh, the Mission Commission will be accepting, kindly accepting your donations. The tuition uh, this year is $400 again <coughs> uh, for an entire year of education. And some people may want to support a full scholarship, but it's possible to support a share of a scholarship, uh, go together with another person to split a scholarship um, any way that you would like to do this. Um, we have 25 girls that we need to continue to support. So um, you can make a check out to the church with PEB in the memo. Um, you can give online. Uh, you can give to someone who in, is waiting outside. I'll be waiting in those Sundays to see what you would like to donate. It's been said that it takes a village to raise a child. And I just want to thank you, thank you, thank you so much for being part of the village of these students in Pakistan. Thank you very much. You know, we, we pray every week um, for the condition of the world. And this is one small way we are trying to improve it by guaranteeing education to girls, right? We aren't going to have justice on this planet until everyone is afforded an education. So again, thank you for being part of um, the village of Pakistani girls, which is pretty fantastic. Um, so we're jumping all around because I didn't have my bulletin and now joys and concerns. And there are some things to add to our list. We've been asked to pray for uh, Robert, who's a family friend of Trisha Flynn and her extended family. I don't know any more about that, but we will certainly pray for Robert. We're praying also for Carol Olson. She uh, is uh, uh, struggling with some poor health and is in the hospital, and so we want to wrap our prayers around her. And we're praying also for the family and friends and by family, I mean Ben, uh, on the passing of his grandmother, Marilyn. We've been praying for her, and she passed last week, and um, her life was celebrated and recognized and remembered um, on Friday. And so we think about the Berman family. Let us go to God with our prayers. Gracious God, God who keeps inviting us to drop our nets or to take a detour or jump from one rock to the next. God who calls us to love our enemies, pray for those who persecute us, to forgive as often as we are forgiven. Sometimes we're our own worst enemies. We get in the way of the things you've taught us and the places you call us to go. But you never stop calling. So we pray for ears to hear and eyes to see what you're doing in the world and how it is we can join in the work. And we pray your blessing on all those girls um, who are being educated in Pakistan and who are gathering Christian and Muslim and Hindu, all in one place. And in all the places of the world where education and diversity are celebrated, we give you thanks. We pray your blessing on our new leaders and on this church as we listen for the Spirit speaking to us and discern particularly our direction as related to the Martinsville campus, but in all the many things that we are concerned about and dreaming about and all the places where we're seeking justice in our community, we pray for your spirit's lead. Lord, we pray for those who are struggling this day, who need to know that they are loved and not forgotten, who need to know your healing and rest-giving presence, who 
need to feel comforted in their grief, we, we pray. We pray for Robert and we pray for Carol. We pray for those who are grieving this day and who are remembering um, with great love, but just that ache of loss. Think of the Berman family and all those who are mourning this day. Lord, we think of our world and we know what's broken and we know that uh, we are your hands and feet and, uh, and even your words of love. So help us to be that in the places of brokenness. Help us to be light in dark places. Help us to examine our hearts that you might create a clean heart in us, O oh Lord, and renew a right spirit in us. For we do long for more and more of your kingdom to be evident among us. Not just on the news and not just on other shores, but on our own. Even in our own homes, in our own neighborhoods, our own workplaces, in our own schools. So hear us as we pray, as we were taught to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, we continue our worship with the giving of our gifts.
nets are full, full of hopes and dreams, full of <clears throat> passions and convictions, full of faith and full of resources. And we pray prayers of thanksgiving for all of that. And we trust that you will use it for your kingdom's work. And we dedicate ourselves to your service in Christ's name. Amen. to our prayers, uh, Ed's son, Eddie, who uh, continues to struggle, and we are praying uh, for him, and we are with him, and we trust that God has not lost sight of him. So please keep Eddie in your prayers. Um, I understand it also might be John Metz's birthday today, so please make sure to uh, give him some extra love on the way out today. Um, Friends, I don't think we can avoid pride or fear, but it is my prayer that we can recognize it when it gets in the way of the call of God on our lives. So may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us, speaking clearly to us, and guiding us, even in spite of ourselves, to all the best of God's glory. Amen. Amen.